Well, let me just start uh, by saying uh, how happy I am to be here. This is uh, really fun to be here with uh, such a great group um, of scholars and, and hearing such uh, interesting papers. And I was really uh, um, just uh, couldn't be more pleased to be part of this. Um, I'm also reminded that the last time I had uh, Margaret as my moderator, the panel ended up almost in blows. <laughs> so I think this one's been organized differently uh, in that we're talking about different subjects. <laughs> uh, that was a very interesting panel. Uh, so as one of my co-panelists said, this is sort of the fringe of the fringe. Uh, we're not talking about um, payday lending, except a little bit at the end. A little bit. Um, Okay, so my topic is, um, is uh, for-profit higher education and the lending that occurs to enable that. Um, and, um, yes. and so one of the things about um, this subject is that um, as I've started to get into it uh, over the last six months or so, uh, I've realized it's, it's sort of a stepchild um, of the sort of fields of legal scholarship. Um, education law, uh, you know, is a field, uh, but um, it really has not taken on uh, this subject at all. Uh, it could be within uh, consumer law, but there isn't a whole lot of work. There's a little bit of work in the bankruptcy area. But as we all know, this is, you know, in the headlines of uh, almost daily, uh, it's clearly an important area uh, of regulation. And uh, so I decided there was some room for, for at least someone to get into it, uh, who ca came at it with both a consumer law and a debtor-creditor uh, background. Um, and, and as I say, it's, I'm not the only one, but it's pretty sparse uh, so far, the interest in this topic. Um, now, when you start to think of a, about it as a debtor creditor and a, and a consumer law issue, um, it's familiar territory uh, as far as means of regulation, right? That uh, there's some emphasis on disclosure, on making sure students understand the debt that they're getting into, um, and then along with that, uh, more substantive regulation, uh, particularly in the for-profit uh, sector, and that's my, my focus. You know, there's the larger problem of higher education in general, perhaps being in a bubble. Uh, but as I think I will detail uh, in this presentation, um, there are reasons to focus separately on for-profit uh, higher education and the um, uh, loan burdens and the default rates uh, and the uh, low repayment rates uh, in this sector. Uh, but the backdrop is very much a general discussion about higher education. And again, there's someone here from Pew. Uh, there's an um, important Pew study that was called, Is College Worth It? Um, and that kind of captures the tenor um, of the discussion. I think some people in higher education feel this has become awfully reductionist, that it's a sort of consumerist uh, a view of higher education. And that actually comes out in the Pew study in that the presidents of liberal arts colleges who were interviewed as part of the study um, talk about higher education as being uh, for personal fulfillment, uh, to be a better parent, to participate uh, in democracy, uh, you know, that it is not narrowly focused on um, on income, although it certainly has um, that feature. All right, um, so when we talk about higher education, there's a, a, a taxonomy of, of uh, private nonprofit, public, and private for profit, but these are thought of as the main sectors. Um, now, I did my, my effort at um, local color was to look up the uh, the sticker price at Washington and Lee, uh, it is $56,000 and change a year uh, to attend this elite institution. Um, and for the law school, it's $66,000 uh, is the, the annual uh, price. So 
obviously, this gives you the feeling of uh, this is you know the issue of um, of price and of lending to pay the price is not um, part of the for-profit sector alone. But a big difference is that only a third of um, students at private nonprofit schools actually pay the sticker price uh, because of um, a primary factor is institutional grants. And I'm sure an institution like this has um, a lot of institutional grants, both merit and, um, and need-based. Um, public tuition has also gone up. Um, 25,000 is sort of a ballpark, middle of the road figure for um, you know, an elite public that is a flagship, flagship uh, state uh, university, although it goes higher and lower, but that's sort of the middle, middle range. Um, all right, when we turn to the non-elite sector, uh, we have players both in the public realm and in the private for-profit. Um, so community colleges are the, the public part of this, um, and they are a bargain, uh, and really they are the best um, access point uh, for, for many students uh, to be able to go for a year for $2,700, which is the, the average tuition as of last academic year. And not only that, students typically do not incur any debt to go to community college, um, they are able to pay the tuition out of income and grants, and I'll show you the, the grant figure uh, in a moment. Um, the trade, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, for-profit sector used to be more trade programs, non-degree programs, uh, but increasingly it, 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 uh, this sector has moved to degree programs and particularly bachelor's degrees um, with you know, substantial uh, tuition, 14000 per year on average. Uh, the earlier, uh, yesterday, uh, I think we heard about earlier waves of payday lending. There was an earlier wave of the for-profit sector. Uh, it really sort of took off in the 80s, and you had a lot of trade schools that were not um, producing results for students, and there was some Department of Education regulation based on default rates, cohort default rates is what it was called, um, that forced the closing of a lot of trade schools in the 90s. And then the industry really changed, that those trade schools had been mostly local. Now the industry is much more um, you know, large, national, publicly <coughs> traded companies. Uh, so it, it's taken on a different character uh, in the last 10 years or so. Okay, one of the problems about talking about this area is it's just so complicated, uh, the, the financing. Um, you know, there's scholarships, um, there's a sticker price, but because of the scholarships, uh, students don't typically pay that sticker price. And then there's grant aid, too, uh, from the federal government. Um, so the Pell Grant is the, um, the main uh, one, and that's for students with need up to um, five and a half thousand dollars ballpark, which for community colleges covers the whole price uh, for most students. So you see there that you know you have an option without debt uh, if you do two years of the community college. <coughs> maybe you're going on to. Um, uh, uh, another public school that will be a little pricier, but you can at least get those first two years uh, at, at a, without incurring debt, uh, even if you have no means. Um, and um, institutional grants are a big part of the picture uh, at private nonprofit colleges, whereas in the for profit sector, there's very little institutional grant aid. Um, and then you, you, know, you have the whole loan picture, the federal loans and all these different categories of federal loans, private student loans, uh, and the total of federal grant and loan aid uh, in 2010 was $145 billion. So this is a pretty substantial federal outlay. Uh, and another part of the financing is um, not 
uh, student aid, but direct aid to institutions, something like the National Science Foundation is huge. The University of Arizona being a research one university gets, a, I think it's over a hundred million dollars a year in NSF funds. So it's, you know, it's a, a substantial part of uh, the budget of many um, higher education institutions. Okay. Um, all right, so the reason for focusing on for-profits is um, that it, it presents the biggest consumer protection problem. It also happens to be the target right now of Department of Education regulation that I will uh, talk about. Um, I think there's a, um, a reason for separating out this sector in that it has the highest debt and the highest default rates of all the sectors. Now, there is an argument by the industry that if, if we're going to be regulated, everybody else should be regulated the same way. But one of the problems with that, of course, is that you would impose on institutions with very low default rates all of these compliance costs. So it sounds like a fair approach, but if there isn't really much of a problem, uh, it doesn't necessarily make sense to, to add those costs. Um, Okay, the Department of Education is, um, at least as far as how it presents its position in its regulatory analysis, uh, favorably disposed toward for-profit schools. And uh, this quote that I have here on the PowerPoint is from one of the regulatory analysis documents that's come out uh, in relation to the gainful employment rule that I'm going to talk about um, in a bit. Um, and the DOE has uh, tied um, for-profit schools uh, to President Obama's um, goal of uh, leading the world in the percentage of the population uh, who are college graduates by uh, 2020. He gave a speech at the University of Texas uh, bemoaning that in one generation we had fallen from first to twelfth and set a goal as getting back uh, to where we were. Um, and so in this context, the um, DOE has promulgated this, this gainful employment uh, rule, uh, which I view as uh, really nibbling around the edges of, of the problem, but uh, it, it has symbolic importance and it may already be having market effects. Um, Okay, so I wanted to give the comparison um, that um, for uh, the various sectors. So um, the last year for which I have data, and most of this comes from co the College Board, which puts out these wonderful publications every year, uh, but some of, it, some of the data lags. Uh, but you can see with publics, 55% borrowed and had an average debt of $20,000. Um, and you can compare, this is in the four-year institutions, the for-profits nearly all borrowed and had average debt of $30,000. So they have higher debt. But they have higher debt even than the not-for-profit sector um, and also a higher borrowing rate. Um, and when you compare to the two-year schools, so the for-profits to some extent are in competition with the community colleges even though they moved into uh, four-year programs. I believe it's about 60% of for-profit students now are in BA programs. Um, but in the, in the two-year public schools, 80% uh, didn't borrow at all in this most recent full data year. Uh, and ha at, well, well, at the for-profit schools, the median debt was $14,000, uh, and that's for a two-year program. So what you have is more students borrowing and higher amounts overall in the for-profit sector. Okay, when it comes to federal funds, uh, the for-profit sector sucks up more than its share in terms of uh, the number of students. Uh, that 10% that, uh, of higher education students uh, were at for-profit schools in 2008-2009. That went up to 12% uh, percent the following year. Uh, that should have been... Uh, 2009, 2010, down at the bottom. Um, and they got, uh, you know, more than 10% of Pell Grants. They got 24% of Pell Grants and 25 to 28% of the uh, federal student loan funds, depending on the program, um, and accounted for uh, almost half 
uh, of the defaults. Okay, this is the latest on the default rates. Um, you can see the for profits there have a 15% uh, default rate, and uh, that compares to 7% uh, at publics and 4.6% at um, private nonprofits. This figure, um, the default rate figure, is not a figure that represents everyone who's having uh, trouble with their loans because it leaves out deferments and forbearances and also delinquencies that students are not treated as in default for uh, 9 to 12 months after they stop paying. So, and this is only in the first two years after graduating. Um, so, you know, the, the, these figures are mostly useful for comparison purposes and if you want to think about, you know, how many people are actually going to default over the life of the loan that the uh, Department of Education is estimating that it's close to half. I think it's 46% in their regulatory analysis. That's a pretty whopping default rate, you know, half of the students uh, defaulting. Um, and the consequences of defaulting are severe. Uh, that you know you lose access to more student loans, and many times the defaulters are people who only did a year or two of a four-year program, and now they don't have access to any more federal loans. So it's the end of education for them if they are defaulted uh, and don't have means. Um, and then, uh, as the bankruptcy experts here know, um, the the discharge is, is severely limited. Um, it's only for undue hardship. There are uh, DOE programs where you can get a discharge, but those are uh, not the easiest thing to access. Um, and so student borrowers end up uh, basically under a life sentence of uh, student loan debt, and they can be subject to garnishment wherever that's permitted by law. Uh, I think a, you know, an obvious solution to, to the situation we're in would be to go back to the state of bankruptcy law in the 90s where you had access to the discharge after a delay period. If you're not benefiting from the education uh, enough to pay your loans after seven years, uh, it might be time to say, you know, we don't really have a, uh, a moral hazard problem. We just have somebody who didn't benefit. Uh, now, as far as how um, the for-profit sector markets itself, it's very reminiscent of the um, subprime mortgage uh, build up in that it's all about the American dream. The American dream not of home ownership but of a college education. Um, and along with that there's been very heavy marketing uh, and recruiting. Uh, there's a GAO study uh, that documented some, some very bad um, offenses. Now that study was called into question by the industry but the uh, agency went back and went over their study again and the the final version, after uh, correcting some mistakes, still has plenty of evidence of inappropriate marketing. Um, and there are high dropout rates. Um, and in the two-year programs, the dropout rates are similar. But the difference is that if you're dropping out of a for-profit, you're typically doing it with a lot of debt. Whereas if you're dropping out of community college, you typically have no debt at all. Um, so what? is the business model of this sector. It's basically federal funds. It runs exclusive, not exclusively, there's a 90% cap, but it runs very highly on federal funds, uh, Pell Grants and federal student loans. Uh, up to 90%, uh, the major players are, you know, in the, typically in the three quarters of their revenue is coming from federal funds. Uh, on the other hand, these institutions are cheaper um, in terms of cost Right, that the price is not the same as the cost because the flagship publics, the elite privates, they have endowments, they have federal science research financing, um, so and they have you know institutional grants. Uh, you know anyone who's been associated with a um, for, uh, a private nonprofit institution knows that, and you're often told this. You know if you're a potential donor, that uh, the tuition, even that fifty-six thousand, doesn't begin to pay. Uh, for what it costs to send a student. Uh, I think it's, it's in the realm of 40% uh, of, of the cost. Um, 
So where does this leave us? Well, the for-profits are viewed by the administration as essential to expanding universal higher education. We're already in the over 50% range, but to get up to a high part of that range. But the price of doing that is meaning that uh, a lot of students are going to uh, be defaulting and suffering the consequences that we're talking about. Uh, you know, the Department of Education says about half um, are not going to make it. And that's, a, that's an alarming uh, you know, um, cost for trying to get to a higher rate of higher education. And a, and a fair number of these folks really are not um, prepared for college. Um, and so you're not necessarily doing them a favor. And it's you know, similar to the subprime mortgage crisis in that you had a lot of people being sold the idea of being a homeowner. Um, who, um, who really aren't, you know, are not better off today because they tried that. Um, so I will kind of go quickly through this because I'm pretty much out of time. But um, a lot of um, my paper is about comparing uh, the subprime mortgage um, crisis with this situation with the for-profit sector, and. Uh, many others have done this. I gave you a couple of examples here. Richard Posner, Stephen Eisler, who was, who was uh, featured as shorting mortgages, subprime mortgages, in the, um, in the big short uh, book about the whole crisis. Um, the mortgage situation, obviously, is just a much bigger one. You know, that you have a 10.5 trillion volume of mortgages compared to, this is a pretty big figure though too, a trillion in student loans as of this year, uh, larger, I think as we heard earlier, than um, the volume of credit card debt outstanding. Um, and so there's some market risk here uh, from you know, that size of a, of a volume, not as much as in the mortgage situation. Um, I think I've already mentioned um, you know, that there are similarities in that student loans have been aggressively marketed. Um, there are nasty consequences for borrowers in both spheres. Um, and in both, you have a problem of, of lack in, of skin in the game. And in the mortgage situation, you had um, originators who were quickly offloading uh, into securitized pools so the people who are uh, arranging the loans are not um, carrying the risk. And you have a similar kind of thing going on with the for-profit sector, that they're helping the students to get the loans and then they get paid after a fairly short period of time of enrollment, and that the student default, defaults later doesn't affect the revenue stream, uh, except to the extent that the Department of um, Education regulation may ultimately do that. Um, you know, we have similar problems of lack of regulation, lack of effective regulation, taxpayers at risk, it's in some ways worse with the mortgage situation in that we have a, a prepackaged bailout uh, with the subprime education situation. The accreditation system is not really doing a good job of policing low quality programs. And so that's similar to the rating agency problem with the mortgage uh, crisis. Now, I think as I mentioned, the subprime um, uh, higher education situation can be seen as worse uh, worse impact in that you can't walk away from uh, <coughs> you know, your education. You've got the education and then it's non-dischargeable, the debt. So it's not like a home where you can you know, hand back the keys and, and discharge the debt in bankruptcy personally. Um, now, I think the, um, the uh, you know, uh, it's a, sm a smaller phenomenon, but maybe the key similarity here is that you have uh, some people who benefit from subprime mortgages, some people who benefit from subprime higher education. And so you have the question, well, how much roadkill you know, makes the benefit to the others um, not worth it? And that's a very difficult normative question, right? That you have, I mean, look at this foreclosure rate in subprime mortgages, you know, more than a quarter in foreclosure as of 2010. Uh, and if you're going to have half of uh, for-profit uh, students in default, uh, you know, you could say it's twice as bad in that sense, in the sense of the, the losers in this whole system. 
Um, and maybe I could just, uh, you know, I'll flash that up for you. This is what the Department of Education has proposed, the gainful employment rule. rule. It hasn't gone into effect yet. Uh, I spent an afternoon recently reading the 14 pages of narrative of the various formulae for this. It's a nightmare. I mean, I actually started feeling sympathy for the industry as I was reading this, uh, you know, what it will take to implement this. But the overall idea is pretty simple, that we want 35% repaying their loans. And the idea is to have a positive measure rather than a default rate, because default rate excludes people in deferment and forbearance and delinquency. Yeah. Okay, this, this is really uh, the end. Um, that, uh, you know, that that's the proposal, is to have this 35% um, repayment rate, and there's an alternative measure. I see this as, as a start. I think it has put some market pressure on the institutions already, um, and there may be some shut down as a result. Um, and the other thing that's been going on is that students are learning that this deal isn't necessarily so great, so the market may be actually responding in that way. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, Jeff Rapp. My co-author, Eric Chafee, and I are going to split our uh, 20 minutes. I think I can speak for uh, both of us to echo all of the thanks that have been extended to those that worked so hard to put this together, especially the student editors. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit with our paper uh, and focus on a kind of lending where the primary concern isn't with protecting borrowers, but arguably instead with protecting lenders. And so far we've heard about uh, a lot of industries involving institutional lenders uh, and uh, risks that those institutions were taking advantage of or not fully informing uh, the borrowers, where borrowers were in need of protection. Uh, our paper concerns online peer-to-peer -peer lending, where individuals are on both sides of the transaction, although as I'll discuss, there's an intermediary in between. Uh, one of the things that came out of Dodd-Frank was the opening effort to do some uh, initial thinking about what the regulatory framework for online peer-to-peer -peer lending should be. Congress directed the Government Accountability Office to do a report on this rapidly evolving industry, and the report, which Eric will talk more about, uh, was issued in July of this year. It outlined two possible regulatory schemes. Uh, one was uh, the approach that has been pursued so far, which was to have a variety of different regulatory agencies regulating different pieces of online peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, and the other was to hand over the entirety of this evolving and emerging industry to the new uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The report didn't choose between those two recommendations, uh, and we offer our take on which of those two would be the better way forward. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending has generated some very significant regulatory confusion uh, in, in ways that we describe as the um, <coughs> square pegs round hole problem. Our securities laws are written in a way that just doesn't contemplate uh, the kind of transactions that are being organized through online peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, and in many ways, online peer-to-peer -peer lending represents the perfect securities regulation hypothetical. So the students out there definitely listen up to, to what we're going to talk about. Because issues like uh, the meaning of the word issuer or the concept of the security, all of these things are implicated when we think about this uh, think about this in industry. Uh, so, what, what am I talking about when I say online peer-to-peer -peer lending? At least in principle, online peer-to-peer -peer lending could be any transaction facilitated by the internet in which an individual is both the lender and the borrower. So I could go onto my Facebook page and I could poke all my friends and say, I need money for a new car. Uh, will you give it to me? I'll offer the following rate of return. Or I go up on Craigslist and assuming away any uh, regulatory issues dealing with securities considerations, I could go on Craigslist and I could invite the whole community uh, to contribute to whatever it is I'm in need of, of spending money for and offer them a promised rate of return. But, but either of those approaches uh, would raise some, some, some concerns. Uh, my Facebook friends list is really short, so I'm not going to probably uh, be able to generate the kind of money I need for any serious investment. And uh, the Craigslist, uh, because I don't know the, the, the source of the funds, and, and the potential investors don't know me, they have to investigate me and find out if I'm an honorable sort. Uh, the result would be that, that it would be very hard to organize 
peer-to-peer -peer lending transactions on the internet without some sort of intermediary. And so the for-profit intermediaries that have emerged uh, are uh, predominantly to Prosper and LendingClub.com. Here's Prosper's website, uh, and here's Lending Club, uh, and they currently offer fairly similar business models. Uh, they allow a would-be borrower to uh, start an account and on the right-hand side of the green, write down how much money they need, uh, what they're going to use it for, evaluate their credit, and then they'll, they'll get an actual credit score. If you're interested in being an investor, you can, on the left-hand side, take a tour. And uh, For investors, they're promising close to 10% returns, which if, if you've got a CD lately, you know, sounds pretty good. For borrowers, you're going to pay 8%. Well, that sounds pretty good compared to credit cards. It sounds uh, pretty good compared to other unsecured loans. Uh, so this all sounds somewhat attractive. And the promise of these high rates for investors and low rates for borrowers is based on the notion that by eliminating the middle uh, middleman of a traditional bank that stands between shareholders who invest in the bank and borrowers who take loans out from the bank, by eliminating that middleman, doing it all through the internet, we can pass on the returns uh, to both sides in the form of higher, higher payback on investment for the lenders and uh, lower rates for interest for the borrowers. So if I set up an account and I go to the uh, list of choices of loans to fund, I have a wide variety of options, but the dominant ones uh, are debt consolidation loans uh, ranging from $500 to $1,500. Not everyone knows how to spell debt correctly. Not everyone knows how to spell consolidation correctly. But there, are, there are a few other uh, a few other interesting requests uh, on, on Lending Club. Uh, for example, someone with a a credit score between a 714 and a 750 uh, wants six thousand dollars to buy a hundred motorcycle, and someone with a 680 to 713 credit score wants four thousand dollars to to fund a wedding. Now, of course, if you if you really wanted to take advantage of the internet, uh, you might embrace uh, a, a true web 2.0 vision of peer-to-peer -peer lending, uh, and that would allow me to say something about what I think of these. To say dislike the idea that the best way to start a marriage is by spending. Four thousand dollars you don't have on engagement, uh, or to dislike the Honda motorcycle purchaser who doesn't seem to want to go to the Honda dealer for for this money, oh, or add additional information like I think you know uh, this person this person somehow I, I I dealt with them before you should definitely invest on them create wikis for each of these uh, potential requests for loans we don't do all of that that we could do with the internet here but we do promise these relatively uh, high rates of so in our paper, we discuss the difficult uh, regulatory issues that online peer-to-peer -peer lending um, uh, raises from a securities law perspective. But I also spend some uh, we also spend some time at the outset trying to contextualize what it is that we're that we're talking about here and what we should be comparing it to. Should we be comparing online peer-to-peer -peer lending to traditional brick-and-mortar banking, or should we be comparing it to the many other forms of informal, non-institutional lending that have existed in one form? in one form or another over the course of this country's history. So we talk about a couple of them uh, in the paper, both to try to highlight what some of the attractions of peer-to-peer -peer lending have been, uh, and also what some of the special risks might be once you move it into uh, an online dimension. So we talk, for instance, about the Rotating Credit Association. Uh, these are popular in this country primarily among immigrant groups that, for various language reasons, uh, I felt disfranchised from the traditional borrowing industry. And so basically a group of people would get together uh, and they would each make periodic payments to a central fund uh, that would then, in a ro on a rotating basis, hand out the fund uh, balance to an individual member. Uh, so I might pay $5 first week, $5 the second week, along with a number of other individuals, and then I get a big payment of $50 in, in the third week, and that represents the rotation of the credit and allows me to use that $50 that I might not otherwise have been able to save up to, uh, to make some investment or whatnot. And the Rotating Credit Association, while it has some relatively high transaction costs, depends on social capital and trust. Uh, people, will, if they default, will uh, affect the ability of others to not completely lose their shirts in these kinds of structures. Uh, and, and Rotating Credit Associations depend upon trust and often built on ethnic or linguistic, bounds, uh, linguistic bonds in order to enforce repayment. And when we think about peer-to-peer -peer lending versus rotating Credit associations, well, there is at least some superficial similarity that they both stand in ambiguous legal positions. Once we go to the internet, there is no trust. 
uh, and we get very worried that, that the rates of default can't be enforced by social capital. We also talked about the numbers racket. Uh, the numbers racket, not as glamorous as it was when Denzel Washington was running numbers in Malcolm X, uh, but this was a form of economic activity in which individual investors would pay some <coughs> small amount of money to a banker, uh, and the amount of money would produce a return that was based on a three-digit number, say, uh, the appearance of which could be predicted, but the values of which couldn't. So for the popular Harlem numbers racket, you'd pick the second and third digit uh, of the bank clearings and the third digit of the Federal Reserve balance, and this, these would be posted on some bulletin board. Uh, that's three minutes of my 10 minutes? Yes. Okay, great. And then we post it on some bulletin board at a time you could predict, and, and so if those were the numbers that appeared on the bulletin boards, uh, the winning number for your numbers racket would be 896, and so if you picked a three-digit number, you have a one in a thousand chance of winning, and you'd get back $600 if you'd invested one dollar in, in the numbers racket. Uh, and numbers rackets were appealing in, in what I think are very similar ways to online peer degree lending, because they were convenient. Uh, like payday loans, uh, which are appealing to some consumers because of the presence of the payday lending site near their work, near their home, the numbers racket was a convenient form of investment uh, for those who participated. Uh, numbers runners would come to your workplace or to your home. There would be numbers tickets available uh, at, your, at your local newsstand or shoe sign site. Uh, and, and that same convenience is what I think drives peer to peer lending. You don't have to go to the bank anymore and fill out an application. Instead, in your pajamas, from your laptop computer, sitting on your couch, you can, uh, you can make a request for a loan or make what promises to be a very uh, high return investment. There are, unfortunately, several concerns that arise with online peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, as we talk about in the paper, the rates of default on these loans have been very high, uh, and there's a difficulty in terms of collection. Uh, the individuals who make the investments don't have the right to go out and collect the loans from the borrowers if there's a default. The sites so far haven't done a lot of work themselves to go out and collect on defaulted debts, and as a result, neither of the two dominant for-profit sites in this country uh, have managed to turn a profit since their inception. Uh, the default rates exceed those for, for credit card rates, perhaps as high as one-third. Uh, and as a result uh, of those concerns, a lot of people who are investing in online peer-to-peer -peer lending loans as lenders aren't getting the 10% that they, they thought they were going to get. At this point, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Eric, who's going to talk about the regulatory side of class. Okay. Uh, I'd like to say thank you also. Uh, it's been a great conference so far. It's fun to be um, in a location with a veritable who's who of the payday lending um, scholars out there. Um, I will say that you're also looking at a veritable who's who of the um, peer-to-peer -peer lending scholars, meaning Jeff and I and one other person at Yale are writing about this. So hopefully if you have an interest in it, you'll talk to us, and hopefully there actually will be more scholarship that's generated out of this. Um, in terms of thinking about regulating peer-to-peer -peer lending, the current model is that borrowers are protected by lending regulation and that uh, lenders are protected by securities regulation. And the reason for that is that in terms of the models that are used both by Prosper.com and Lending Club, uh, what you have is a situation in which a bank, a bank um, actually initializes the loan and originates the loan to the individual borrower. Um, that loan is then sold to the platform, which then sells a note to the individual lender, um, and that note is a security. And the reason for that is that if you know anything about securities law, um, if you take a look at Section 2A1 of the Securities Act and Section 3A10 of the Exchange Act, what you see is that in the lengthy de definition, there are two uh, words used, investment contract and notes. Um, both of which cover the notes that are at issue uh, when you are dealing with a peer-to-peer -peer lending transaction. Um, the reason for that is if you look at the Howey case, which is a prominent test uh, for um, what constitutes an investment contract, a 1946 case from the Supreme Court, um, the test ultimately is whether the scheme involves an investment of money in a common enterprise with profits to come solely from the efforts of others. Uh, very much in terms of, t of thinking about this test, it's met in the sense that peer-to-peer -peer lending is done by lenders for purposes of investment. 
lenders, um, arguably what you are doing is making connection between individual lenders and individual borrowers, but as a result of the bank being involved um, and the fact that the platform is the one that's actually collecting um, the debt from the borrower and is actually enforcing the debt and the fees uh, that are involved in peer-to-peer -peer lending are going to support both the bank and the platform. You really do have that common enterprise element met. You have the uh, profits coming solely from another because the bank and the platform are actually going out and collecting the loan. And as a result of it, that it fits within the definition of an investment contract. Um, in terms about, of thinking about whether or not it is a note, um, definitely um, there is controversy there in the sense that securities laws um, only cover notes that are purchased for purposes of investment and notes not, and not notes that are issued for purposes of consumer financing. Um, you have the Reeves test uh, that comes into play there, which is horribly convoluted, and I promise Jeff that I won't explain, despite the fact that I'm very um, excited about it because he wanted to protect the people in the audience who weren't interested in security <laughs> regulation. Um, but I will say that the central focus there um, very much is whether or not it is a note for purposes of, purposes of investment and really why the lenders get into these particular transactions are for purposes of actually making an investment, um, whereas the borrowers may actually be trying to um, finance some sort of consumer purchase. Um, in fact, the lenders who are, who are protected by the securities laws really are making an investment that merits um, protection um, under federal securities regulation. Um, both of these arguments were backed up in November of 2008 in which the SEC issued a cease and desist order basically requiring Prosper.com to register the notes that it was selling. Um, at that time, um, the uh, or Prosper Marketplace had actually already entered into a consent decree with the SEC agreeing to register the notes. Um, there has been um, some controversy in terms of the scholarship by scholarship, I mean the other article on for-profit peer-to-peer lending, <laughs> as to whether or not um, there, whether or not, in fact, um, the particular instruments at issue should be considered securities. Largely, uh, the other author, who's Andrew Burstein, uh, who runs a center at Yale, he comes at it from the direction that um, there are strong policy reasons to let the industry grow and perhaps put it under the auspices of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau rather than simply allowing it to, um, to evolve um, as it has under uh, securities law and lending regulation. Um, in terms of uh, thinking about the regulation of peer-to-peer -peer lending, uh, as Jeff pointed out, uh, with the uh, signing of the Dodd-Frank Act in July of 2010, what we saw is that Congress came to a compromise uh, to allow for a study of peer-to-peer -peer lending meaning the House um, and the Senate actually were lobbied very hard by the peer-to-peer -peer lending industry and specifically Prosper.com uh, to put peer-to-peer -peer lending within the purview of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, and ultimately, um, the House was willing to do that. The Senate uh, balked, and you see the study that, that um, actually uh, generated the government accountability um, report uh, that Jeff talked a little bit about that was issued on July 7th of 2011. Uh, within the year time frame that was actually mandated by the Act, um, provided lots of useful background in terms of peer-to-peer -peer lending in ways that we hadn't seen previously. Um, definitely talked about state regulation, um, which figures in as a big piece of all of this because states with merit regulation have been extraordinarily reluctant um, to allow peer-to-peer -peer lending because uh, both sites admit in the registration statements basically that they don't verify the information from individual borrowers and how risky um, this type of lending can be. Um, but the GAO report, um, like many GAO reports, uh, really did not take a strong stance, meaning it pointed to two regulatory options, either to put it within the auspices of a sim single administrative agency, uh, probably the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or in the alternative, um, simply to leave it um, to a similar um, sort of regulatory system as traditional lending, um, especially in terms of the uh, borrower side, meaning um, because you have banks originating the loans, lending regulation or protecting those borrowers. 
Um, in terms of Jeff and my take on things, um, in fact, um, despite the fact we've seen a number of instances where people have had very strong takes on what to do in terms of regulation, especially with payday lending, um, we are both of the same mind that in terms of thinking about peer-to-peer -peer lending, what needs to be done is simply to allow the industry to evolve. And the reason why we think that's important is because with the current, um, current model, you have a robust system of uh, regulation protecting the borrowers, meaning that they have the benefit of lending regulation, a robust system of, uh, of regulation that's protecting the lenders, meaning securities regulation, and the industry is, con is continuing to grow. Which it doesn't, of course, mean that the industry will actually, is growing at the rate that it could be growing, but at the same time, um, we have both also are of the same mind that unfettered growth um, in most instances ultimately leads to a market crash and would prefer to see peer-to-peer -peer lending to continue to both grow in a steady and meaningful way um, rather than having some sort of dramatic market crash very early on that might potentially lead um, to basically people abandoning the industry. Um, in terms of thinking about peer-to-peer -peer lending and the future of peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, as I was discussing with Joshua Fairchild at dinner yesterday, Web 2.0 definitely is evolving and it's also implicated in Jeff's remarks. Uh, it is interesting to think about the direction that peer-to-peer -peer lending um, might actually end up going. You know, in, in terms of thinking about Web 2.0 and uh, Professor Fairfield and my conversation, you know, really, uh, whether or not peer-to-peer -peer lending will stick to the particular model that it's using right now is a very open question. Um, as Jeff correctly pointed out and uh, very rightly pointed out in terms of his remarks um, and peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, we have a model right now that has a bank in the middle, but there really is some value in terms of making direct connections between individual lenders and individual borrowers. There are other sites out there that have done that, but they really haven't gained the, pro the prominence of Prosper.com and LendingClub.com. Um, at some point, more regulation might be warranted if you do see that type of uh, pure um, model of peer, -to peer lending evolve. Um, in terms of thinking about that, you know, really you switch from an ex-ante um, disclosure type of base system that we currently have to an after-the-fact ex-post type of situation in which uh, really the only regulation would be anti-fraud, um, criminal and civil anti-fraud provisions. Um, and at that point, it might make sense to put it within the uh, purview of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But at least um, at this point, we think that peer-to-peer -peer lending and regulation of it uh, very much merits a wait-and-see approach. Thank you. connection here because we're talking about internet lending and I am going to be talking about internet payday lending today um, and as you can see it has to do with tribal sovereign immunity and we'll get into that in a minute but I just feel this deep urge to make some comments generally about the debate because my paper really isn't about that the topic that I'm speaking on I think every single person in the room probably feels the same way about which basically is that something has to be done about uh, this tribal sovereign immunity. So I want to make a couple of other comments first. Um, first of all, I'm fascinated now by Paige's smoking analogy. And I'm just wondering if there's some way that we can use this in this debate, because let's face it, we all know smoking's on the wane, right? I mean, people just aren't doing it anymore. And so I don't know if it's the stigma, the cost, the education, the inconvenience, but it's an interesting question. I think it really is. And I think um, I'm probably more aware of how little smoking everyone is doing because I'm probably the only person in the room who's still doing it. And uh, that shows that I don't always make rational decisions myself. Um, in any case, thanks again to you two guys and also so much to Jim Hawkins because if it wasn't for Jim, we wouldn't be here at all. This was his idea. He really organized the whole thing. And we did participate a bit uh, in getting it off the ground, but it, he's really the person who brought us here. So, okay, um, i just going to comment a little bit on this agnosticism, just a bit. I can't find him. There he is. Okay, I, that's fine. You know, I think agnosticism is a good idea. But, guys, let's not lose our common sense going into this, okay? So, I don't know. One of the debates that we're not debating here is who are the consumers who use these products. But if, as many of us suspect, we're talking about very poor cash-strapped 
people who do have an emergency every week or every two weeks, then, you know, I'm just asking, I mean, does it sound like it would make sense to have people borrowing $200 and paying back $2,000, if that's the kind of person we're talking about? It's just a question. I'm just asking you. I'm also asking you, if you could, to pay very, very close attention to the market. This is another project. I wish I was talking about that, but I can't. I have to talk about this tribal paper. But, I mean, if somebody pays off their loan right away, let's say they, they took out the loan for the two weeks for the short term, then with some lenders, maybe a lot of lenders, they're going to get a phone call on their way home. They're going to get a call asking them if they would like a bigger one. Okay? And not to be too one-sided and cynical about this, but it sometimes looks like you got to make that loan big enough to make sure that that never happens again, you know, that they just pay it off and get out, okay? Now, how do I know all this stuff about what goes on in the real world? You could say I don't, and this is all anecdotal, but I am both a doctrinal law professor and a clinical law professor. So I teach in a consumer law clinic. I have regular, sustained, daily contact with payday lending customers. And some of them are there to, to deal with problems about the payday loans. Some of them are not. You know, it just comes up in some other way. But I know that someone said earlier, customers like these. And I'm sorry, I'm not willing to, uh, to take that one sitting down. I have, I'm sure there are some who love them, and we know a lot of people use them, right? But I never met anyone who was glad they got involved, to be honest. And I, most of them are not used for emergencies. And the main thing that I do think we probably all know by now is that people can't predict the overall cost, and they certainly, relatedly, cannot predict how long it is going to take to pay the loans off. So that's my two cents on the debate. Now I'm going to get into the uh, purpose for which I have been asked to speak today. Um, anyway, so internet payday lending is the big uh, growth part of this industry, right? I'm sure you guys know that. Some of the most amazing advertising in the world comes out of this internet payday lending industry. And a while back, I was able to locate an ad where a lender was suggesting that someone use the internet payday loan to, to attend a bachelor party. And I will say, I do want to say this, and Jim actually pointed this out to me, the industry was very angry about this. And so I had blogged about it, and New York Times guy blogged about it, and the ad is no longer available now. So I guess that's good, I don't know. Um, but anyway, there has been a tremendous shift. Well, first, what is the problem with it? I'm not sure everyone would agree that there is a problem, but the rates are higher. So instead of 400 to 600% interest, we're looking at uh, usually between 800 and 1,000 percent, maybe 600 to 1,000. The other problem, customers are sharing tons and tons of their data over the internet. So all of that is being collected, it's being used in various ways that I won't get into today. Um, and also the procedures that are used make it very, very difficult to get the loan paid off. So you have to sort of pay it off a certain number of days before you know, this happens and that happens. And in our AG's office, we've been working, working, working on trying to get people out of these loans. And it's tremendously difficult to get them out of the loans, even if you found the replacement uh, credit. So in any case, huge market share is shifting from storefronts to Internet. And you can see why some people would like it better, right? It's much more discreet. There's definitely no stigma. You can do it in your pajamas. Um, so what is accounting for this big shift? It's not just that customers prefer it. Um, it's also um, that basically there's a lot of formation through Indian tribes and through offshore locations. Like the Isle of Man seems to be the, you know, the next big thing, from what I can tell. I have some friends in the investment banking industry who will tell me when they get portfolios for internet payday lending, and I can sometimes see how they're being organized. Okay, so what I'm really going to do here today is talk to you guys mostly about what this means for regulating the payday loan industry. It's definitely going to make it much more difficult. I forgot to say, so why is it that these lenders want to, in, want to go to Indian tribes to organize? Okay, using up my 20 minutes here. <laughs> yeah, what they want to do is they want to avoid state laws, right? Because if you can partner legitimately with a tribal lender, then you don't have to comply with state laws because you are immune. Okay? So Paige talked about 
um, economics, or no, I think it was behavioral economics 101. Now you guys are going to learn for about five minutes uh, tribal sovereignty 101. So it starts with tribes are sovereigns, right? So they're governments. And this means that there's a level of government, uh, a layer, I mean, of government out there that most people probably don't think about very much, right? You've got the federal government, you have states, we obviously have a lot of local government, but tribes are also governments. So don't forget that. And you can't ignore it just because you don't know anybody who is Native American or anything like that, okay? So what is the general rule? The general rule is that tribes are subject to state or federal suit or process only if Congress has authorized that suit very, very explicitly, okay? Basically a statute that says this statute waives tribal sovereignty. Maybe it's a little bit broader than that, but it's pretty narrow. Either that or the tribe, again explicitly, has waived their sovereign immunity. Okay. Now this next slide is kind of a shame because too much information on one slide, I know. But this is how it developed. There was a bunch of Supreme Court jurisprudence on this starting in 1919 where tribal sovereignty is just sort of mentioned in passing. Okay, then we could go through um, a case that says explicitly tribes are immune, then one that says tribal sovereign immunity extends to commercial activity, not just government, but commercial activity occurring on the reservation. And then finally, the sort of flagship case in this setting is this Kiowa case, which says tribal sovereign immunity extends to any commercial activity by a tribe, this is gonna become important in a second, on or off reservation, okay? So you can see what happened there and why basically recognizing the tribes have the right to self-govern and also prioritizing economic development and tribal self-sufficiency, okay? So that's kind of the policy behind Kiowa. Okay, now since Kiowa, um, there has been, well then there was this one other quick case I'll just mention, Inyo, which at first when you looked at Kiowa, it said tribes are immune, right? So you kind of think, okay, there's this tribe out there that's doing business, you know the tribe is immune. But then along came this case and made it very clear that it's not just the tribe, it's also the arm of the tribe, right? So we're trying to figure out what that means. We've been doing that ever since, trying to figure out what this means, because nobody really knows. And it's been mass chaos, there's, there have been 71 reported decisions as of about six months ago, um, about what the arm of the tribe basically means. And most of them are not in the context of payday lending. I'll talk about payday lending in a minute, but you know, you can imagine, I'm sure, you all look like you're falling asleep, so maybe I should call on someone, but what would these cases be about, do you think? Casinos. Yes, a lot of people getting hurt in casinos. So they want to sue in court and you're not allowed to do that. What else? Okay, I'll just tell you guys, in Kiowa, it was a contract action. So basically, tribe signs a promissory note agreeing to pay certain funds and then decides, oh gee, I guess we're not going to pay these funds after all, and then they couldn't sue over that. So contract actions. Um, there's also an important one that we're going to look at the test in a minute, but it's called BMG versus Chuck Chauncey, and this is a 10th Circuit case. And this is really a bizarro case, because this is basically a tribe that went out and got two that, that, that paid for two programs to train their casino employees um, and then gave that program to 1,800 other employees. Like basically stealing, I would have to say, the intellectual property of this training firm and the fees were like a million some dollars that the firm was out. And so we're talking federal law now, right? Starting to get a little scary here because this is IP law and there are a bunch of different tests for whether or not this constitutes an arm of the tribe, whatever it is, you know, that it's formed as. And this was a tribal corporation. It looks like it was 100%. Okay, so those are the settings in which this is coming up. Now, next question I'll ask you guys is what constitutes congressional authority or abrogation of sovereign immunity? And there's one other sort of interesting case that I think also has a bit of an outrageousness to it. Okay, this one is called Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martinez, and it's a 1978 case. It involved this woman from the Santa Clara Pueblo, which is in New Mexico, where I'm from. Um, she was married to a Navajo guy, and in her tribe, 
if the woman was married to someone outside the tribe, the kids did not get to become tribal members, and they couldn't inherit, and got none of the benefits of, of that tribe. And that was her situation, right? Because she's married to this not old guy. She's got these two kids, and she wants them to be able to inherit. Now, if it was reversed, and it was the guy who was Santa Clara, and he was married to some outsider, then the kids would be part of the tribe. They would be members. And so this woman wants to sue the tribe under the Indian Civil Rights Act. I mean, this act, it's a federal law, and it was designed for this kind of stuff, you know, that you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. And basically, the U.S. Supreme Court said, Sorry, but that Indian Civil Rights Act wasn't that clear. It never said that tribal sovereign immunity is abrogated. And moreover, we're talking about a matter that is so deeply important to tribal self-determination, who gets to be a member, that kind of thing, that we are not going to allow the suit to go forward. That gives you a little bit of a flavor of how serious this really is. How am I doing? I'm totally fine. Okay, I'm talking fast. Okay. So... Now we're at the point where we are trying to decide one of the $10,000 questions today, and that is, what's an arm of the tribe? So, I talk in my paper how, about how there is just mass confusion about this now, because every single court that has tried to go in and figure out what it is has decided to make their own test. And frankly, a lot of the tests violate Kiowa, okay? They just, they're not okay. And so I told you guys, I really won't get Socratic on you, but I told you that Kyla said all activity by a tribe, commercial or governmental, on or off reservation, is subject to tribal sovereign immunity. I mean, some of these things violate Kyla. Not the method of creating the entity. That's just about is it a tribal corporation or not, basically. But the entity's purpose, I think that one might, right? I mean, that, what, what does that mean? Um, entity structure, ownership, management, control, and tribal influence over the, over the entity. F financial relationship between the tribe and the entity. And did the tribe intend to share sovereign immunity with the entity? So these are some of the types of tests that you're going to see. I'm kind of fixated on the control thing. Because what you may not realize, just note in passing here, is that if you do get a chance to see how the financial structure works in a lot of these entities, you see that the tribes are not getting very much, okay? So in one case out of California, which we have discovery, the tribe was found to be getting 1% to 2% of the proceeds, okay? So as one of my Native American colleagues asked me, he said, well, okay, but I just have a question about this control. I mean, if the tribe is really controlling this, then why doesn't the tribe that's in control pay itself more? You know, I mean, it would make more sense, right? Why would you just say, okay, that's all right. We're in control. We'll keep 1%. We'll give the other 99% to you guys. doesn't make a lot of sense. But we also have to be careful. We don't know what the, you know, what the economic situation is for many of these communities, and generally it's not that great. Okay, so what, what many people assumed was that we would be able to just use state courts to somehow figure out what was going on in these different lenders and see if they were genuinely arms of the tribe. And so in this Amerilone case coming out of California, you have a court that is holding that sovereign immunity cannot be waived or disregarded by a concern for consumers. I didn't need to tell you guys that, right? You know that. I mean, sovereign immunity is sovereign immunity, right? So just because a bunch of consumers are, you know, getting taken advantage of, some might say, some might not, um, that's not reason. That's not reason to go in there and aggregate. And then they come up with this thing, which some people think is really great. We can imagine a tribal entity that's so distant from tribal interests that it could no longer be legitimately seen as an extension of the tribe. Well, to me, it looks like it could still be fairly distant. You know, I mean, I don't know. But this language is not as helpful as I think it could be. Okay, so that raises the question of how much control is really enough. I'll show you one more test. And this is out of this case in Colorado. What a disappointing case for the AGs of Colorado who've been trying very hard to get a handle on this. This is the Supreme Court of Colorado's test. One in three are gimmies, aren't they? I mean, yes, I know how to form a tribal corporation. 
Um, you know, does the entity's immunity protect the tribe's sovereignty? It really comes down to does the tribe own and operate the entity, okay? So we don't know what percentage we need of ownership. We know nothing. But that court, while they were saying all of this, they said, oh, and by the way, the state has to prove all this stuff, okay? So the burden of proof is to prove that none of this is true. Prove a negative and somehow come up with the data that you need to do that. So that makes the discovery become just super duper critical, right? Because we're seeing that played out now. It, oops. Hmm. I lost the slide. Okay. Well, I'll just have to tell you. Is there a way to make it go backwards? <coughs> Okay, that's all right. It's gone. But anyway, so there's another case in California, and it's called Bailey. Um, and basically, they are fighting about discovery right now. I can read a little more about that in my paper if you're interested. But the private plaintiffs, it's not an AG now, so this might make a difference too, whether we're looking at government versus private. But what they said in Bailey was we need, based on this concern for ownership and control, we need a very thorough explanation of all of the business operations critical to doing this analysis of who owns and controls this allegedly tribal uh, lender. And the lender said, oh, no, 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 no. That type of discovery totally violates sovereign immunity. And in fact, that pries into the internal affairs. This is the thing you're not allowed to do present to the internal affairs of the tribe, okay? So this thing is still in litigation. We don't know where that's going to go. But let me just sum up with this. Right now, at least on this topic, it seems to me that most of the lenders who are out there are not arms of the tribe. And most of them, you can get on some very interesting websites and see that sometimes they say they're owned by a member of a tribe. That's, I mean, that's like you saying you get sovereign immunity because you're American or something. Um, it doesn't work, but they're catching on, okay? So in the future, what I predict, uh oh, I'm down to one minute. Okay, so the, in the future, what I predict is that more tribes might start to do this. So who can do something about this? Um, one of these four might be able to, tribes themselves, hey, this is scary. Congress could come in and totally abrogate sovereign immunity. That's something tribes don't want. I'm hoping that this will be something they will take upon themselves to regulate. U.S. Supreme Court could go in and say, oh, you guys misunderstood Kyle. We were talking only about 100% tribally owned businesses, for example, since we don't have an answer to that. Congress clearly has a lot of authority. And I think that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau probably has the authority to, um, to regulate this. There is one other regulatory case that I point you guys to. It's the second one. You can ignore the top one. Um, that's Coeur d'Alene, where the court held the tribes had to comply with OSHA in their commercial enterprises when they were employing non-Indians. And the reason the court said that is that there are safety concerns here. And also, this issue of whether in your farming operation you have to make sure people don't get their hands cut off or whatever, that doesn't go to the internal workings of the tribe. So I think what analogize on my way out, that if we're talking safety, right, and this is about safety. I think you could at least make the argument, and it's a decent one, that the CFPB is also concerned with safety. So that is the starting point for that analysis, I think. Questions? Yes. I have a question about tribal internet lending. Um, as I understand it, the, the sovereign immunity means you can't sue them. But I think, doesn't it also, but it still means that they're supposed to comply with state law, and if, if the loan is made in violation of state law, it's an illegal loan. You can't sue them for it. But it's still an illegal loan. Well, where does it get you is what I wonder about. Well, it's for, the, for the person that calls us and says, what about this loan? And you tell them it's an illegal loan, and they don't have to pay it back. And I just want to... Right. I selfishly want to make sure I'm giving the right No, advice. that's true. And actually, um, where is the gentleman from Pew? Is he back in the room? Okay, yeah. So we were having a great conversation about this issue about whether, you know, you have to pay back the internet payment loans. Because my understanding, and I have blogged about this on credit slips, is you don't have to pay them back. Because very few, if any, I just actually got some data on this yesterday. So there are a few of the internet lenders that are actually licensed in my state 
But yeah, most of them are not. And if they're not licensed in my state, then the consumer doesn't have to pay them. They can close their bank account. And most of them are going to use the judicial system to sue them, for sure, right? I'm trying to avoid that. But the problem is, it's not that easy to just say, oh, you don't have to pay it back, because they do. Um, is it Jay? Alice. Alice. What Alice was pointing out is they have all this information. So they can call your mother, your brother, your employer, and just keep bothering you. And so even if they're not going to sue you, they can do a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, just to comment on this model, um, I think a lot of people, uh, obviously not people on the panel, but even very sophisticated lawyers who practice in consumer lending, confuse the concept of preemption with the concept of uh, sovereign immunity. So it, it is not the case that by virtue of the ability to export tribal law, uh, Indian tribe lenders or arms of tribes can make these loans lawful. They, they are unlawful everywhere. It's, it's simply the case, as Jay correctly advises, that uh, the loans remain illegal, but nobody can be sued for them. Um, this, is a, this is going to be a very troublesome and very persistent model going forward, and uh, everybody needs to get smart about it because it's going to be uh, persistent, uh, it's going to be very difficult to regulate, and um, Indian tribes have lots of friends in Congress. There was a young lady behind Hillary. You had your hand behind. Well, just to bring to your point, um, we deal with a lot of internet payment lenders, and they uh, one of the things that they use against borrowers is actually to actually negatively report on your credit. Mm -hmm. So even though they won't sue you in state court because they can't, they have no standing. Because in Virginia, for example, it's an illegal loan here, but they will negative they, they will and do negatively report on people's credit regularly all the time. So that affects them, and these are a lot of times borrowers who maybe are trying to avoid dealing with credit issues or trying to repair their credit, so they're going to an alternative source so that they aren't having to default on something that would affect their credit. So in that case, it does, they, not only do they raid your bank account and or they sell your bank account information and your social security number to other entities, some are lenders, some are not. Um, some are fake debt collectors. There's a lot of mm -hmm. other issues that surround internet loans. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Oh, here, go ahead. So, well, it's actually more permanent, but uh, you can't sell that information without permission under the law. And if the loans are illegal, why don't you go to the major credit bureaus and say, if you get recorded information like this, you shouldn't be uh, taking any account because these loans are illegal. We, we have a new, and we tell every consumer who gets an internet-based payday loan to tell the credit bureaus. We have, tell them to put a fraud alert, and then we tell them to also tell them if they are negatively impacted. It, not every lender does, but there are certain lenders we know of, we have a little list. So we'll tell them if you have a loan from one of these particular entities, then yes, you need to tell the credit bureaus that you that if they were negatively report on it, then it's not. They can, you can just submit it. I guess I have a yeah, question about um, the subprime credit higher education here. Um, are there better and worse actors in this market? Um, and can we regulate in such a way as to spare the good while eliminating the bad? No, that's a tough question. Uh, I mean, that's not the model of the regulation that the DOE has proposed. It's, if you're in this sector, you are subject to this. Um, you know, I think it's one of those things that are going to be compliance costs for sure, but once people get up and running on it, uh, you know, it'll, it'll reduce the costs. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, if you have an idea of how you would break out these sectors, you know, I mean, they could have something after a certain number of years, you know, being above, you know, maybe you only have to do it periodically or something like that, you know, you can picture. Um, and there are also going to be some competitive advantages, right, that, that is by elimination of some of the bottom dwellers that will help, you know, other, that you'll have a redistribution to other parts of the sector. Um, yes, kind of along the same lines. Uh, in one of your slides, you said that, or it seemed to indicate that for-profit universities are doing a lot more of uh, EA-type programs. It, does the data suggest that those programs are 
less effective or more um, effective in producing uh, graduates that can pay back their loans? Yes, I mean they have lower, um, you know, six, they have higher default rates, higher debt burdens than people in four-year or other so, schools. So sorry, I, I, I think I misstated. Um, I, I mean, compared to the more like the trade, the more traditional like trade programs, uh, do the for-profit trade program graduates have higher or lower? Uh, Default rates. Yeah, thing. I mean they have breakouts by certificate programs, which some of those trade programs would be certificate programs. Um, um, shorter programs obviously have lower amounts of debt, right? So um, that helps them somewhat. So there's a kind of you know apples and oranges comparison problem. Is if you're doing a four-year bachelor's program, and and by the way these are often they're denominated bachelors, but they are very specialized. My favorite example was a bachelor's in beverage management. So, you know, you're getting, you know, you're getting something that says it's a bachelor's degree, but it's actually a, a trade program. And that's one of the Department of Education's uh, complaints, is that these degree programs are so focused on one particular job, that's part of the problem. They don't really create flexible workers, you know, they're teaching you how to fill the beverage machines, I guess, and order beverages and having internships in beverages. <laughs> Joshua. And I, I was watching, but I may have missed it. Um, is there data on just straight up employment outcomes rather than default rates? There, well, the way the DOE is going to do this is they're going to use income which they're going to get from the Social Security Administration. Uh, and that's for the second part that I didn't really talk about, the, the debt to income ratio. So you wouldn't have income unless you're employed. So that is part of the debt to income ratio. And if your income is zero, you know, then you're not going to meet the debt to income so ratio. Forward, we will right. have a test of that. So I'm wondering if we have any data on it now. Mm. Yeah, but you have to report employment within six months of graduation to the Department of Education. What that doesn't tell you is whether you're making three dollars an hour or you're, you know, you're, you're running a uh, sophisticated graphic <laughs> 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 design piece of machinery. So the, the department's got lots of data on employment outcomes, but if, Professor, as you suggest, the trick is to link that up with the ability to repay based on yeah, and that's a figure like the law school placement reporting, right? If you have to report the minimum wage uh, law school graduates as employed you know, to the American Bar Association. Up in the back row. Oh, that was just the point that I was going to raise, that you can look at employment and how much someone is making, but you don't know if they're making that money due to the degree that they've received, or they just, you know, whether they're out of field, or, and again, the law school context is a perfect example of that, you know, are you, you know, the, yes, I'm employed, but I'm, I'm not employed in anything requiring a JD, I'm not employed in any position that requires that I've gone to law school for five minutes, so, but yet, we're all employed for U.S. News and World Report rankings. So, I think that's really what you need to get at, whether or not the employment has, is related to what the degree, uh, what you've you know, gone into thousands and thousands of dollars for. And all that the DOE is asking is that 35% of the graduates are able to repay their loans out of their income, which isn't a real high bar. And, and it could be in some job that has nothing to do with their degree program, and they're still going to pass. You know, the, the institution will pass, or the program will pass. I want to direct a question to either Eric or Jeff. And, and that is the question that I was intrigued to see your comment in your paper that these uh, peer to peer lending arrangements have not yet become profitable. And you also said that the returns were not the nearly 10% <coughs> promised to some of the lenders. How is it they haven't died on the bond as a result of those two facts? So they're hot from a venture capital perspective. They're very well, the two big sites got a lot of interest up front. Mm -hmm. So they have money. Um, you know, 
will they will the big ones be gone? The, it, these are the two big ones. There have been 14 or 15 other different models that have tried. One that I that I find most enjoyable uh, was after Prosper raised its minimum credit scores up towards you know 650 area and they weren't making any loans in the 500s. This website came out saying we're going to offer online peer to peer lending only for poor credit risks. And it you know, managed to stay in operation for about four, day, four hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the well capitalized ones, they've got the war chest to make, maybe they're not making profit, but they're able to, to keep people going for it. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, just a quick suggestion for, also for Eric and Jeff. Um, Eric, you